Ladies and gentlemen, I'm very excited for this podcast today. Sitting in front of me right now in the studio is Robin and Eric Buckley. <laughs> Hello. How are y'all doing? From the Appalachian Center for the Arts, From of course. From the Appalachian Center for the Arts. Indeed. We're doing well. How are you doing? How are you doing? I, I'm cold. Very cold. <laughs> it is way too cold right now. I, I'm we you, just laugh you at guys, the coldness. You guys down here, your, blood's, your <laughs> blood is so thin. Yeah, 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 y'all are from, well, who's from Chicago? Who's from New York? I'm from Chicago. And I'm originally from Boston. Or the but, burbs of Chicago. But we oh. lived in New York for about 30 years. So this to y'all is it's nothing. This is springtime, this basically. Is absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. We'd be wearing shorts. Yes. <laughs> although, although, as Robin says, she's like, I'm done with the cold weather. This is well, nice. That's <laughs> largely why I was, you know, I saw Kentucky and I'm like, yes, I want to go there. So, so what what really made y'all uh, come to this part of the area? I know I've asked you before, but for listeners out there that may not be familiar, because somebody's probably wondering, what is somebody from Boston and Chicago doing teaching art and theater in downtown Pikeville, Kentucky? You know what? Um the opportunity presented itself, and um, Kentucky, uh, you know, we had been looking for a rural, um, a, a small town uh, to move to with our daughter. We were just, um, you know, as you can imagine, the rat race of... Yeah. New York's a great place to visit. And when yeah. you're young <laughs> yeah. and... Living in it, unless, you're, you know, unless your last name happens to be Rockefeller, <laughs> it's a tough place. It's really cost prohibitive, yeah. and it's just the way of life. It's just really um, hard to maintain. And um, we were, like, really looking uh, for a, a, a simpler way of life. Oh. And I, I'm from a rural small town in Illinois, like almost exactly the same demographics of Pikeville. Mm -hmm. And um, he's from a more suburban area, but it was just like we wanted something simpler. Um, And, you know, the fact of the matter was that this amazing facility with all these opportunities uh, came came up and they called Robin. They said, you know, you were recommended to us. We'd like to put you on the search list. She said, great. She came down and they she sort of fell in love with the area. She was like, there's just something about the mountains, Eric. You're going to love it. And I was like, okay. Yeah, and the people. Mm-hmm. I was just like, oh, yeah. my gosh. I, so, just, yeah. I love it. I and, fell in love with it. And we literally made the decision over a, ma- a matter of like two weeks. We were like, okay, wow. great. And we, you know, and we did the opposite of loading up the truck and moved to Beverly. Yeah, you know, we loaded up the truck and moved out of New York City. <laughs> hey, I'm the same way, though. I came from kind of a more urban place in Georgia, and I totally get – the peacefulness of yeah. an area like this. Yeah. People that have grew up here their entire lives just don't understand the no. hustle and bustle of a busy city. I couldn't imagine, especially Chicago and New York. Oh, yeah. I mean, and uh, don't get me wrong. Uh, uh, or, or, oh. or, or It's it's a blast. Oh, yeah. They're amazing, yeah. Pla- they're amazing places They're amazing to places to they're just visit. Um, hard. They're just hard. Yeah. They're hard towns. Um, and it's very, very uh, doggy dog. Yeah. You know? well, yeah, and that's something I've noticed more around here. It seems like uh, people that are in the art community, whether it's well, entertainment in general, music, comedy, theater, it seems like everybody uh, tries to help each other out. There's not so many egos going on around. Mm-hmm. And it's just uh, it's more of a team effort than mm-hmm. a solo thing for a lot of people around here. Oh, yeah. Well, there's, you know, again, it's no, we're also it's a different thing in that there's also fewer people who do this for a living. True. You know, it. some people, it's a hobby, it's a passion, those kinds of things. And the people who do it for a living understand that there's also limited opportunities. So you that community goes for, get, is very small and very tight. So mm-hmm. everybody recommends and helps everybody else out. Right. Yeah. And, and, and I've seen, well, I see all types of things that you post all the time about uh, classes that people can come and take. Because whenever you think of a theater, mm-hmm. you know, you just think of like going to see plays. You don't think you can actually oh, no. be a part of it yourself. But uh, you're doing what I, well, it's really cool. I was wanting to be a part of it so bad the other day, and I'm going to get down there eventually, is the uh, comedy improv. Tell yes, people about that. Yes, improv comedy. So, um, you know, and you know because you're uh, you do stand up. I was always struck that there wasn't a, a, a robust local, uh, locally grown comedy scene down here because yeah. I find the people um, incredibly uh, funny and have a unique and uh, prescient take on life and the world yeah. and tell amazing stories. I'm like, 
why is there not a homegrown comedy yeah. scene down here? And also, Robin comes from Chicago, and she went through the Second City program as well as uh, Improv Olympics. And I took classes at the Upper Lake Citizens Brigade in New York as well as the Magnet Theater. And, you know, and, and in doing improv, um, there's so much of it. You ho- you're you doing it all the time in the theater because no one wants to take responsibility for writing anything. <laughs> um, and, I mean, more than once— I, you, you're always asked to improv stuff in commercial auditions. Um, so you're improving stuff, and then you're like, "Oh, I said that," when it shows up in a commercial. <laughs> when somebody like, else, oh, yeah. you know, um, yeah. and that's that's fine. It is what it is. But yeah, um, but it was one of those things where we were like, "We love improv. We know how much fun it is. It's something we've been trying to sort of organize to get up and running as far as a training program for mm-hmm. it." And so we started last Wednesday, and even amidst it, you know, as again, as Northerners, we laughed. We're like, it was an inch of snow. People are like, it is the end of the world. <laughs> I can't come out tonight because. And again, we also we also do joke about that. But the truth of the matter is, when we first got here, and people said, oh, if it's an inch of snow, everything shuts down. We're like, oh, what's wrong? And then we saw the hollers. Exactly. And we yeah. understand. We're like, oh, you live on a vertical incline. That's and and it's a one lane and road. It's a one lane. Yes. Entire thing. Yes, yes absolutely. Where, where the you know, where, where sometimes the you know the drainage off the mountain has eroded the side of the road, yeah. so you you literally have just enough space for those tires. Now I appreciate it, uh, but that being said, people were like, "We can't come out, we can't come out." We still ended up having almost as many people as we were expecting co- total. Nice. But that being said, uh, it's an open enrollment class and it's free, you know, which is a, which is great. We were able to you know find a ways to juggle things around and make sure that uh, we could offer that. So this uh, the uh, improv comedy is this something that's going to be fun for the entire family or is there going to be kind um, of age restricted? This is uh, adults. Yeah, okay. This is uh, I mean we absolutely come from the improv place um, in all our classes, you know, because um, I think it's all about acceptance, you mm-hmm. know, offer and accept, offer yeah. and accept, um, and so we it's a kind of a rubric in the children's classes. Yeah, but um, this is but this, this is a specifically for adults. No, we're not. Oh, speci- yeah, we're not. So yeah, exactly. Yeah. You know what? Sometimes it's like, you know what? The kids get a lot of opportunities to do this. Exactly. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, the yeah. adults get, you know, and it's so funny as we joke, we say, you know, my, my, when you're, when you're not working, you spend so much time saying, well, I have to spend time with the family and the kids and that's great. But then you realize like, oh, I'm not doing anything for me at all. Right. Hey, yeah. You know, yeah. it's self-care, man. And especially in. It's important in this yes. business. Oh, my God. Oh, and, it, and in any Every business. business. Like, I, I just think for the past year has got everyone like, ah. yeah. um, and but I want yeah. them to have a, a, an outlet. Yeah. yeah. So this is going to be for this is, this is for the adults. Now, that being said, we're not going, OK, great. Everybody come in and give us your foulest language possible. Yeah. yeah. You know, we're always we're very much like, look, we, we'd like, you know, we're not going to tell you not to. It yeah. doesn't it certainly does not offend me, uh, but that's not what we're going for. Uh, but it's got, it's a lot of fun. That first class went really well. We had a, everybody who was involved. Where I, we were like, "Are you enjoying this?" They said, "Oh my gosh, yes." They said, "Are you going to come back?" They're like, "We're coming back next week." I said, "I'm bringing my you know, and I'm bringing my cousin." Who, who's <laughs> That's last, awesome. Whose who's last name is also Thacker? No. Um. <laughs> <laughs> well, improv comedy is it's one of those art forms of comedy that is uh, not gotten as popular over the years, unfortunately. But whenever I was growing up, I watched you know whose line is it anyway? Saturday Night Live, mm-hmm. of right. course. But I mean, all those greats like uh, Robin Williams and Chris Farley. Now, it was so funny because you didn't know what was going to happen. Like, whenever Richard Simmons was on Whose Line Is It Anyway? That is embedded oh my in gosh. my mind. <laughs> it, 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 forever in times. Of it's, course. <laughs> well, and, it, it and also, so it's, it's, it's that element of surprise. Yes, That it element of, you know, it, just like when Celine Dion is just singing in the stratosphere... I'm, I'm old. I said Celine Dion. I know, I know. Um, uh, Taylor Swift. Well, she kind of sings. Oh, my Lord. Anyway, <laughs> uh, you know, you, you hope she's going to make that note. Yeah. It's the same thing with, with comedy, with the improv, because you're like, oh, my gosh, how are they going to how are they going to get out of this? Yeah. yeah. Or how are they going to do this respectfully or. Uh, well, and the other thing is this. It's just one of those things where. The, those, you know, the people you mentioned in particular, the, whose line is it, folks, Robin Williams, Chris Farley, the folks on uh, Saturday Night Live, they are all, you know, at their 
the, the best ones are masters at it. They're yeah. masters. They make it look easy. Yeah. Watching uh, watching somebody improvise a song, you just sit there and go, I have no idea where you came up. And mm-hmm. it's because, and again, it's because they do the, the exercise over that we're teaching. And over and, all, and over and, and it, over. It, but it's also fun because like it, all, it's, it's still serious, but there's a lot of the seriousness taken out of mm-hmm. it. Mm-hmm. Because well, like yeah. with, with Saturday Night Live, whenever you see them breaking character, that's when everybody starts laughing because they see that the performers are having having just as much fun yeah. yes. as the crowd is. They're not trying to take it so serious. Yeah. And yeah. it just makes it a lot more of a fun atmosphere. Yeah. You know what? I should best best advice I ever got on anything was um, he said, you know what? You take your you said, you take what you do seriously, just don't take yourself seriously. Right. And I'm like, oh. there you go. That's good. I can do that. <laughs> I yeah. like that. So so what made you uh, think about starting an improv comedy around here? Well, you know, I just think there's um a need. And mm-hmm. I felt that like there was um a need now, you know, yeah. especially. Yeah, everybody needs to laugh right they now. Comedy right laugh. now is needed more than ever before. Oh my yeah. gosh, absolutely. And here's the other thing: there's nothing else like it at the moment. There was, you know, you look around here, and there's a, you know, you can find music if you look. Now again, during, during COVID, you got to go online to find it. Uh, safety, all that stuff, wonderful. You can find music. You can, you know, for us, you can find theater with us in other places. You can find music. You can find stand-up comedy other places, sort of thing. But this. Not within, you know, a 90 mile radius. Yeah, if you're lucky. I, I was trying to think of like where I've seen improv comedy, even like the little social sh- circles that I'm in in Charleston and Lexington and Louisville. And yeah, I've, I can't think of one, to be honest. Well, and it's funny, being a comedy troupe, one that actually is, you know, it, it basically comes out of a training program into it. Those are hard because you have to make the commitment. Mm-hmm. You know, your, your, your teachers have to be there on a regular basis. Your performers have to say, yes, I'm coming in on these weeks because you do trust, you know, so much of it is built on trusting who you're working with. And and also, like I would say that it's all built on practice. You know, this this is something... absolutely about practice. Yeah, you you can't do this by yourself at the house. I mean, maybe you can, but (laughs) it's not going to be that good. It's something that you have to do as a group. Yeah, Mm -hmm. lots of editing would be involved (laughs) if you were doing it by yourself. Um, No, I think especially, you know, this pandemic... Um, has made us all pivot and be super creative and figure out how to do it. Um, but this will eventually pass. This oh, yeah. will eventually go away. Um, at least be manageable or what? I you know I I am not a scientist. Um, really? So I play one on TV. <laughs> yeah. um, but um, people are going to want to laugh and people are going to yeah. want to come out mm-hmm. and they're. Um, I think. Uh, Introducing the short form first. Um, there's two forms of. Oh, oh we're not, not going to talk no. about short form. We're not form going, going into a dissertation on the on the on the intricacies of improv. Okay. Uh, but we can say this is <laughs> basically what we're. But basically, what we looked at was this is an opportunity to sort of lock and load, so yeah. that when it when things do open up again, we're we've been doing this for a while. Yeah, you know, that, we've been yeah. you know, we've been building the mental muscle memory in for people so they can have right. fun and just do it as opposed to go. I need to be funny right now. Right, so, mm-hmm. and that's good. one of the that is one of the uh, the by, the byproducts in the beginning. Like for early improvisers, they're like, I've got to be funny and I have to have one liners and and it's like no, just learn. Learn your learn the mechanics. Learn of the mechanics. It. Offer you know, and accept. It's it's yes, very yes and it's very. I'm going to use the new version, Cobra Kai, as opposed to saying Karate Kid because I am that old. Um, so yeah, Cobra it's, Kai it's, is good. Yeah. Are you it's, watching it's, Cobra Kai? I've watched a few episodes and I like it. They done a good yes. job. I was really yeah. worried whenever I heard yeah. that all that was going but on. It's, but yeah, it's good. good justice. But it's very you know, it's teaching Daniel San wax on, wax off. He doesn't know he's learning karate, but yeah. he does. Same with this. Learn the mechanics of the improv, and then when the time comes muscle memory kick in yeah mm, i like it and also uh, it's not just improv comedy that y'all have going on i've seen where you're doing a 2021 spring classes as well yes we are we are indeed we are starting that i believe if it's, i think it's next, next week. week yeah wow next week we're starting again they're very sm- they're small classes limited number uh social distance everybody will be wearing masks and those are for mo- those are for the kids and we've got acting programs we've got a uh, design program we've got creative play for like the real young kids and the itty bitties yeah, shannon the, the itty bitties is <laughs> shannon shannon kirkpatrick who is our uh Daniels. chief chief cook and bottle washer um and uh those start next week and we're really excited to get some of the kids back in because they've been 
really itching to get back. They keep, you know, their yeah. parents, when, you know, can you got to like, open that place back up because Susie needs to come back in. And we're like, <laughs> well, Susie doesn't need COVID, so let's do this right. Uh, so, yeah, we start that. But our venue is allowed up to, uh, our, we're at 50% capacity. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we can have up to 50, uh, up to 100 people yeah. in the building. But we're, wow. but again, we're being, as everybody should mm-hmm. be, and again, uh, not mm-hmm. political at all, but following the guidelines that they're coming out of the state and yeah. Andy Bashir's stuff, he's doing it right. Yeah. And, and also, like I can speak for uh, from self-experience. I went down there to check out the Native Reflections exhibit that we're going to be talking about here soon, and I couldn't have felt safer. Everybody yep. is seated six feet apart. Everybody's wearing a mask. It's totally... And yes. al- al- also, you got the elevator. you got the stairs. Mm-hmm. You yep. It's... It's an it's a little atmosphere that you have yes, going on down there. Yes, and we clean. I mean, yeah. rigorously, like uh, after each time. It's we... true. Robin showers. <laughs> I know, um, <laughs> but it no. It's but it but Some it is that, it's, uh, not as much. It is that it. You know what? It's and again, it sounds like we're pandering to be pandering to the city, but uh, the city of Pikeville County, Pike Pike County, uh, their Department of Health have been uh, amazing, and they've given us guidelines and help, and they've said you can do mm-hmm. things if you do this first, and so we do it. And it's also it's awesome that. Uh, we have somebody like you two to be teaching this in downtown Pikeville with well, all the experience you. that you have and all of your ver- years in the entertainment industry. I mean, I couldn't think of What do you mean? I'm so young. <laughs> I, so, um, <laughs> but yeah, it, you know what? We're lucky to be here. We're, we're great. We're grateful for the opportunity. We're grateful for the things that we're able to bring that we already know how to do and the things we learn from being down here. Yeah. See, and also everybody wants, I've, I've heard this a million times from parents, that the kids need something to do <laughs> around here to keep them out of trouble and yeah. yada, yada, yada. What a perfect experience that it could be for them to go and learn a trait. I mean, and yes, learn yes. something that, that, artistic. I think that everybody needs to uh, have some type of creative hobby mm-hmm. in their life. Yeah. And this would be the perfect one, especially starting them out young where they're yeah. so energetic and their mm-hmm. mind can yeah. And not every child, I mean, I, I love sports as much as the next guy, but not every child enters the world uh, through physical uh, expression. You know, they're not all competitive. Yeah. They're, um, you know, so there have to be other options. And, you know, um, to, to go along with that, it's like, you know, you don't want your kid, your kid playing basketball is great. Your kid playing, your play, kid being a bench warmer on the basketball team is not great. Exactly. You know, that's yeah. frustrating. That being said, we don't have any bench warmers. Everything we do, we try to make sure that everybody who's involved gets a moment at least to shine. Absolutely. That's awesome. Part and parcel, part of the deal. Yeah, I, I was the same way whenever I was growing up. My family were big sports people. I never was. Mm-hmm. I was more into the, uh, I was a band geek and right. stuff like that. And I would have loved to have had this opportunity whenever I was a kid. So that the fact that some young and up-and-comers do is fantastic. Yeah. yeah. We're, again, like I said, we... we we take, Robin always c- refers to the app itself. She's like, it's a public trust and one that we take seriously. Yes. And uh, also, like we were uh, mentioning earlier, uh, you don't just have all the plays going on. You have one of the coolest things that I've ever seen in my entire life here in Eastern Kentucky, and that's the Native Reflections exhibit. So for yes. the people that may not know, tell them a little bit about it. Um, well, uh, we are a Kentucky arts partner. Uh, so the Kentucky Arts Council, um, they have a representative, Mark Brown, who represents uh, folk art and whatnot. And he called me up uh, right before Christmas and he said, I have this fantastic exhibit and do you want it? And I said, yes. <laughs> now, you, for those of you who have been in the building, uh, you may not realize this is the upstairs lobby was actually always intended to be an art gallery. And so we took the opportunity that COVID provided, which was basically, okay, you can't do shows because you can't put 200 people in your building all at once. What are you going to do? So we, Robin, Robin said, we're going to turn that lobby upstairs did, into I'm what like, it was supposed to be. So we ripped, up the, we ripped up the very, very interesting looking industrial carpet. Uh, we, <laughs> like we sanded down the... Sand the floor. Sand the floor. We sanded down the, the concrete. We painted the concrete uh, and uh, really did turn it into what it was always intended to be, which is a gallery. And yeah, it's exactly what it looks like. I mean, the uh, the paintings, they're on the wall that mm-hmm. the street the street artist well, done. And, were, and those are fantastic. actually pro panels. Um, uh, from uh, yeah. 
Those because we, we, we're in the process right now of finding a, a hanging system, but that's actually something that is uh, it's a, those are like fake walls that we were able to put up. Yeah. I did not. I had no idea. I, know. I would have you never seen known. Cool? It's the power of illusion. Uh, <laughs> but yeah, no, it's a it's a terrific exhibit, Native Reflections, and it's all art that is painted or carved or whatever the medium is by uh, Native Americans from Kentucky and what's called Native Inspired, which is a legal term, which means that you have ancestry that's Native American, but you're not a, uh, an enrolled tribe member. Yeah, and uh, so there's a Native American. Heritage Commission of Kentucky. And they curated this. And they curated it with the Kentucky Arts Council and the Heritage Council of the state. So Frankfurt and everyone in Frankfurt. Lots of alphabet soup. Yeah. <laughs> uh, yeah. So um, they curated it. And it's, so the artists are all from Kentucky mm -hmm. and they're all mm -hmm. native. And then yeah. the big Sandy Heritage Museum. This is the real get. Um, uh there's many artifacts yes. in the museum, which is housed on the fifth floor, I think it is, or third floor of the Pike County uh, Jail. Mm -hmm. There's the museum. Yeah. And uh, the big case, uh, we have a, what do you think? Ten we actually, pieces? what basically what happened was every time they build something in mm -hmm. Pike County, uh, there's a group of people who this is their passion as they go and they find they say well you've started construction you've started digging let's see if you have any artifacts down here and yeah. sure, sure enough, enough you know like yeah. when when they were building the parts of the commons they found numerous arrowheads from hundreds of years ago they found an axe head that dates from 5000 to 8000 BC yeah, this is, we're going to be uh, posting pictures for everybody that wants to check these out, yeah. and uh, it's it's amazing. But the uh, artifacts was something I was really excited about because during quarantine, I just went down this YouTube rabbit hole of <laughs> like these ancient uh, sites here in, in the United States. Because, it's easy to do. Yeah, well, what people often think about. See, I've always wanted to go see places like Stonehenge mm -hmm. or the yeah. pyramids or Machu Picchu or yeah. and any of those. Go back, go back to Tepe. But uh, I know that probably never going to, and there's in totally different countries. But I started finding out that there's all types of. Uh, ancient civilizations here in the United States. Oh, yeah. Yeah, there's a there's a Stonehenge up in New Hampshire. Mm -hmm. uh, there's mm -hmm. a bunch of places out in uh, New Mexico, just all oh, these. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, it's the... Um the one the, 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 the civilization that they don't even know where what happened to them. Yeah. Uh, oh, yeah, well, Anasazi. That sounds really that actually, good. Yeah. I, I, Isn't I think it the Anasazi? That, yes. Yeah. 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 There's nobody here to tell us we're wrong. You see exactly. So. <laughs> it's the Anasazi. You, yeah. You, you, you'll, get, you'll get YouTube comments later. That's not what it is. That's okay. not what it is. But but, like, but it, it really is fascinating though because yeah. like we often think especially whenever it comes to around here's heritage we think of you know the old bluegrass players and the uh, our ancestors who were living off the land mm -hmm. we oftentimes don't think about the native americans and other people who may have settled around this area yeah. and whenever i was looking at some of these artifacts and we'll post uh, pictures up online for people to check out while we're talking about it yeah to, to find like the axe well the axe that you were uh, talking mm -hmm. about mm -hmm. that is close to well approximately could be 10,000 yeah, years old. Seven to 10,000 years. And the amazing thing is this that we found out because we, again, we were not knowledgeable about it, but we tried to make ourselves about it, was that they didn't settle here. Right. The, Kentucky, well, this was hunting this grounds. Was hunting this grounds. was hunting grounds. And it was sort of a crossroads hunting, hunting ground. It wasn't just for the Cherokee Nation, which is actually one of the ones that is considered the closest because mm -hmm. they would come in from North Carolina. They would come in, spend some months, hunt, get the game they wanted and leave. But it was sort of the tribes came in from everywhere yeah. to Kentucky, and they said, "No one's going to settle in this part in, in this part here, but there's a lot of game here, so we're all going to sort of take turns d throughout the year and hunt at different times." It's good that they had that agreement because that could have went very oh, yeah. bad. And then we just found out that apparently in southern Ohio, mm -hmm. there's an area that was um, that was the trading area, so all the tribes would come to the same area and trade amongst themselves. It's hmm. really cool. Yeah. We've really just dived into this yeah. since getting this exhibit. Yeah, and in fact, that's what uh, the where we did that was, uh, I'm going to butcher this name and I'm going to say it right, is the Warriors of Anagadawa. That was gr great <laughs> job. You see? Yeah. You see? Okay. Uh, the Warriors great of Anagadawa, they're coming out of Cherokee, uh, North, North Carolina, Carolina, and they're going to come on the 13th of February at... Two o'clock. Two o'clock, and they're actually going to perform... 
in the theater, and it's free. It's free to all. Free to all. Wow. And uh, it's gonna. They're gonna be doing some of the native dances from the Cherokee, and talking about the fact that uh, you know, talking about how Kentucky was vitally important to the survival because they would come, they would hunt, they would get the game and bring it back home. Wow. See, I, we, we, I just never would have thought that we would have so much Native American history right here in eastern Kentucky. I've been to places like Cherokee and uh, other reservations and stuff. Mm-hmm. But uh, Did my, you go to the Cherokee, North Carolina? Have yeah, you ever been yeah, there? The, yeah, it's really cool. Oh, Did you yeah, go to the museum? Yeah. It, it's, it's been years, and I was really young. But uh, from what I remember, it was so fascinating. Yeah. And, and I got to uh, watch like some of the rain da- They performed yep. some of the rain dances yeah. and, and stuff and, like yes, that. And Such so an interesting culture. It yeah. is a beautiful culture. And the museum is beautifully done, exquisitely yeah. curated. Yeah. It's so uh, elegant and respectful and, uh, and it, illuminating. I, I, I yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, well, make see, the trip. Yeah, I went to the museum. My parents went to the casino. So okay. yeah. <laughs> you see, and that's the opposite. We, the parents should go to the to. museum and the kids should go to the... Okay, no, okay. maybe not that. Uh, <laughs> but, but really, though, because uh, it, it... See, I love ancient stuff the same for the same reason that I love vinyl records. So whenever mm-hmm. I hold a vinyl record, <laughs> I'll say, you know, who who, who who held this before? Yeah. Like where where That's did true. it come from? Yeah. Why well, did they use it? Why did they stop oh, using yeah. it? Yeah. And just whenever I see a, ten, a potentially 10,000-year-old axe head, mm-hmm. my mind just starts oh, racing. Yeah. Well, and the funny thing is in America, we do appreciate this because our history as far as what we consider to be American culture only goes back about 250 years, 300 yeah. years. Uh, whereas uh, there's a great comedian named Eddie Azard who did a great bit about being in Los Angeles versus being in London. He's like, you know, <laughs> in Los Angeles, they turn around and, and they're super proud. And this building has been around for 50 years. <laughs> and he, people are like, no, no one was alive then. <laughs> and he's like, you know, meanwhile, we're in Ireland or in England going, eh, it's been around for like 20,000 years. Yeah, yeah. Mm-hmm. Give me out the way. <laughs> well, and, and you know, it's a. Uh, what also is fascinating to me whenever it comes to ancient cultures and especially stuff like this, like artifacts like this, the reason that stands the test of time is it's all made out of stone. Yeah. And yes. a lot of the uh, sculpt, well, the uh, places there in England that you're talking about, like oh. Stonehenge and some of the things that they think that may have been built by the Knights Templar and stuff oh, yeah. like that, the only reason it's around is because it was built of stone. One one artifact that y'all have down there, which blew my mind whenever uh, you told me this, mm-hmm. is the uh, necklace. Mm-hmm. Oh, yeah. That How, came out intact. Yes. I, that right. That right there, how in the world did it remain intact for who knows how many thousands of years? I, yeah, that's I, I mind know. blowing. It really is, and you know, there. And the, what what kills me is now, like, actually, and this will segue nicely into what uh, one of our other ones later is that they keep finding new sites all over the world because for hundreds of years, for thousands of years. Things were built on top of existing things. Yeah. They didn't go and say, you know what, this is a flat surface, we're going to go build over there. They would go, this is a flat surface, we're just going to throw some dirt on what's here now and build on top of that. So you literally will see you know, excavation sites that go down levels and each yeah. level is each time you go down to a new level it's like oh that happened a thousand years before that and they just covered it oh and underneath that is another thing that happened a thousand years before that yeah. exactly yeah, yeah well, we there's so much history that we've forgotten over the years yeah. and, and probably never will get back unfortunately oh, yeah. but that, that's what i love love about it though is because you it, you'll never figure it out it's nope. just a continuous no. rat race and yep. it's so interesting well and what do they say um those who don't learn from history are doomed, Do- doomed to, to repeat it doomed to repeat it so i love the history and I, I i i love delving into it and the 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 dramaturgy of it like who held this axe who yeah. wore this necklace you can just speculate and and story yeah. tell Exactly. Uh, it's really uh, and, something. And what yeah blew my mind whenever I was reading about where some of these artifacts were found, too. For example, the uh, axe head was found during the construction of the Pikeville Commons Shopping Center. Yep. I know. That's, yeah. yeah, I mean, I've shopped there hundreds of times. I never thought I would have been standing on top of what potentially may have been. Like, who knows what they were using that axe exactly. for? It could have been yeah. hunting. could have been war. Could have, Who knows? You know, and that's uh, it is true. It, there are very few places that you can imagine being able to go and buy fifty pound bag of dog food and then a ten thousand year old axe head. <laughs> exactly. That's you. Know. Yeah, even the uh, some of these artifacts right here were improv built, comedy. <laughs> they were like built during the construction of a uh, Pikeville Walmart. Yes, yes, yeah. Well, yes. Y- you uh, told me what this one was right here. Whenever I was down there, uh, wasn't that a hatchet? I, I think that's don't, a don't hatchet me. head. Yeah, I think, yeah. See, that's a uh, so fascinating though. 
and uh, has stood the test of time and for those this are many right, years. I mean, so many people who've come in, we've had several, several people in every week, and they're like, I had no idea this was here. I'm like, in yeah. Europe. Yeah. Like, we, we got, right? I had no idea until y'all yeah. started posting about yeah. this yeah. at the beginning of the year. Yeah. And that's I had a, no you know, idea. That is one of the things about the area that we are, you know, it's and you don't go, and we're fighting against this, is that we're trying to change the idea. The, the idea is so many people go, well, there's nothing to do around here. And um, you're like, really? Because really? that just means really? you're looking because this I stuff have happening. Something, we have something to do every weekend. We and, go out and say, wow, you know, what about this? And this is oh, everywhere in this? Pike County, Floyd County, Electric County. It's check s- check out their, the tourism sites because I think a lot of people don't look at them because like, I don't need to look at the tourism site. I live here. It's yeah. like, well, then you don't know what's happening yet. Because there's <laughs> really amazing stuff in yeah. all these eight counties yeah. of the chamber and and. I, I, yeah. Every yeah. county we've gone to. Yeah. And I've people, lived here 12 years. I never knew any of this yeah. stuff. Yeah. Absolutely. And, you know, like I said, that we, we were thrilled that we were able to have that be sort of the opener for the gallery. And, in fact, because of the work of Robin Irwin, a woman who's on our board and works for the city named Kathy Atkins, um, then we've actually got one, two, three, almost four exhibits coming in back to back to back. Mm-hmm. In fact, after this one, we have... Well, the, uh, uh, we have... Um, Smithsonian Institute uh, Crossroads Changes in Rural America. And it's part of the uh, Museum on Main Street um, initiative of the Smithsonian Institute. So the Kentucky Humanities, um, uh, in association with the Smithsonian Institute, curates how rural America has fundamentally changed in the past 60 years, yeah. let's say. Mm-hmm. And they've uh, built uh, uh, an exhibit piece. Um, it comes in 19 boxes. Oh, wow. <laughs> so but it's, y'all it's have fun on, with that. Yeah, it's exactly. It's going to be here February 18th. Yeah, that'll get, um, and the February 18th, that'll get here. And then that's basically where our opening ceremony for it is going to be on the 27th. 27th. Yeah. And uh, it's it really is a beautiful, breathtaking exhibit. And it's going to be there for... Six uh, weeks? Uh, it's oh, uh, it opens February twentieth. Oh. Our opening reception is the twenty seventh. Um, what all is going to be included in this exhibit? Um, well, there are. I mean, the nineteen boxes. It's um, there are many pieces that like there's video and and oh, things so you can interact. 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 Oh yeah, yes. that's neat. Okay. Yeah. Yes, and and um, so it's it's audio, it's video, it's pictures. It's 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 really a beautiful exhibit. I mean, you know, it's a Smithsonian. They know they know what they're doing. Yeah, they're, oh, yeah. they're pretty, pretty smart. <laughs> and um, and again, uh, we're um, we're offering up uh, sort of a, a Chautauqua Pikeville uh, or Pikeville Chautauqua. Um, we're uh, Effie Waller Smith. Um, if you. Have you have you ever heard of her? No. Oh okay. my gosh, she's she's a remarkable. She was a poet here. She came from Pikeville, uh, African American woman, grew, uh, grew up in Pikeville uh, in the turn of the century, hmm. and she actually was the first African American who was published in Harper's, which was a big oh, deal back whoa. then. And she came out of here. Her she they, people call her the Emily Dickinson of the Cumberland. Of and the Cumberlands. It, yeah, and it's yes. really, I mean, her stuff is very much, oh, and ahead of its time, too. She was doing, like, feminist stuff uh-huh. uh, in one of her poems oh, called Bachelor, Bachelor Girl, Girl, which oh. is stunning. She we should does, have brought the book. She does discuss, oh. her, you know, some of the race stuff, but she also brings, it's really mostly a sort of nature poem in the same way that Emily Dickinson stuff was. Well, and what, tell them about... Um, and what was her name again? Effie, Effie Waller-Smith. Smith. And that's her... Portrait. Yeah. Uh, in fact, yeah. The, if in our upstairs gallery, there's a humongous uh, canvas that actually has a picture of an African American woman on it, and people are like, "Who is that?" We're like, "That's Effie Wallace Smith. She's in the Kentucky uh, Writers Hall of Fame, and she was from here. And so few people know about her. And the interesting thing oh. is this: she sort of was lost for a time. Yeah. Hmm. She was quite famous in her day. She sort of faded off, and then in the '60s and '70s, people sort of started to rediscover well, her. Well, and Dave Deskins, and Dave Deskins, uh, who's from the area, who you know really spearheaded, uh, sort of relaunching and saying we need to. And Rusty Jess yeah. is like people who and really. Her, but her poetry love is gorgeous. This, hmm. yeah, it's beautiful. This region. And the funny thing is, there's not a lot of information out there. You have to hunt for it. Yeah. To to find out about her and even her poems, but. Uh, well, and her father. Uh, um, oh, yeah, it's just it was a, her history is very interesting, and we're actually having part of our Chautauqua is there's going to be an actress, uh, Jessica uh, Lee Mullins. Jessica Mullins. Yep. From and she, uh, and Birchie, she, I think she's. Yeah, and Birchie. she's basically she's going to perform a monologue 
about as Effie Waller Smith uh -huh. and use some of her poems on that performance. And so, oh, wow. yeah, it's going to be very cool. But that's that's going to be uh, one of the app's contributions besides hosting the actual exhibit. And then the exhibit itself moves to the big Sandy Heritage Museum. Doesn't no, it? no, I think it goes it, it goes somewhere else. I'm trying to think where it goes, but it doesn't go. Oh, it does there. not. No. But then I'm lying. Oh, born in the uh, Chloe Creek in Powell yeah. County, yeah. Kentucky. Yeah. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, it's yeah. A, really it's, fascinating. Yeah, I, I like the picture. She seemed like a very serious woman. Well, and the funny thing, no crap, tiny. I like it. Teeny <laughs> tiny woman. She was four foot eleven. Whoa. Yes. Yeah. She's a teeny tiny woman. Uh, and but, she was part of the uh, first real integrated community. Yeah, Chloe um, Creek was that in, Afrolachian. Yeah, keep, uh, Chloe Creek was uh, considered one of the first in integrated communities in East Kentucky. Yeah, it's where African American and white people lived next to Afro each other. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, that is cool. That's yeah. a cool little terminology. Um, right there. And oh, then, it, but then after the uh, after the that exhibit, we even have another one coming in again, which is the World of Jesus. So it's artifacts and archaeology and art from the first century. See now that stuff like that is really fascinating mm -hmm. to me oh, too. It's unbelievable, and it's a gorgeous. And Tommy exhibit. Chamberlain, uh, uh, with in association with the American. Go for it. <laughs> oh gosh, I'm sorry if I I I'm bastardizing this yeah. like the American Biblical Research Council. Well, yeah. Um, but before we jumped on air here, we looked yeah. at some of these, and I, I don't see how y'all do it. To be honest, with some of these long names, these oh yeah, these two have. You know why? Because ninety percent of the time, it's just it's written down. We're just like okay, uh, and memorize it right before we say it. Um, <laughs> but it, it's a breathtaking exhibit with just artifacts that are. Truly astounding, and, and that's it, it has been through here before yeah. at U Pike, but several years ago. Several and years, and uh, he's got new pieces. But it's beautiful, and it's going to be that's going to be here all summer, right? Yep in the in the app mm -hmm. from April tenth through September eleventh. Oh wow! So you people yeah. gonna have plenty yeah. of time. Yeah. Absolutely, and it is really quite an astonishing exhibit, and the fact that that something of the size and the quality of what it is is going to be right upstairs in the app mm -hmm. is it's crazy. What are going to be some of the things that people can see in that? Oh my gosh! Quite frankly, we've only seen uh, pictures we've of things. We've only just seen and, and stuff. Oh. I, yeah. I, you know, as we get more information, urns, we're going to set. We'll send them your way. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it's also months from now, <laughs> yeah. so yeah, I, yeah, exactly. Yeah. I understand. Um, and then stuff that's really cool. Yeah, and then <laughs> and during old. all this, during all this, we're also planning on, you know, again, as we always say, COVID willing. Um, COVID. We're going to be. <laughs> Bye, Corona. We're going to be relaunching the in-person summer camps because they're telling us, you know, people go, "Who are they?" You know, they. The omnipresent <laughs> they. A uh, friend of mine used to joke said, "We've done some research. We found out when they say they say it's it's the Van Patten family." <laughs> Don't know why, but it's um. <laughs> he doesn't even know who the Van Patten family anyway, is. Anyway, do you know who no, the Van Patten family? Wow. Okay. Okay. Don't I'm explain. Gonna, who no, the I'm gonna. I have to. I have to. Now, oh now other people are wandering yeah. out See, there. Exactly. Okay. okay. So there was a show in the '70s called Eight Is Enough." It was a family you ever heard of it. Yeah. The father, the the, the patriarch, was a guy, an actor named David Van Patten, uh, named Dick Van Patten. His son, David Van Patten, was an actor. He also had another son, Chris Van Patten, who was also an actor. And then his sister was an actress, yes. Joyce Van Patten. So they were they, the Van Patten. The family. Van Patten. Chris had the least cool name out yes, of all of them. Absolutely, yeah. right. Yeah. Um, um, but anyway, they they're he's telling in a us a bunch of uh, Mel Brooks movies yeah. too. Oh, okay. Yeah. Well, the, he, you know what? I love he was, Mel Brooks. He was the um, he was the leader of the planet in Spaceballs. There you oh, go. okay. So there you go. There's his claim to fame. Um, but basically, <laughs> random yeah. facts by Great Eric movie. Buckley. But anyway, he uh, the the scientists and health officials are telling us that by the summer we should be able to gather again in size to a certain degree mm -hmm. so we are relaunching our in-person summer camps so nice. we've got a great a couple of great shows coming in uh junie b jones jr which is for kids uh 5 to 12 and then we've got susical jr which is going to be the kids 13 to 18. so that's mm -hmm. all going to be going back in and then we're going to be Starting work on our main stages, and we're gonna uh, we're gonna reannounce those soon. They were, you know, a lot of them are going to be things that were supposed to happen in 2020, the year that wasn't. Yeah. <laughs> well, it, it's so exciting that y'all are finally starting to gain traction again oh. with what it is that you're doing because there at the end of 2019, the beginning of 2020, it seemed like y'all were on top of the world with oh, everything yeah. that you yeah, had going like, bam, on. Bam, yep. bam, Check, bam. Checking a lot. Yeah. In fact, the last performance, if you don't, we did do we did get to do in a very very small. Uh, in a small fashion with a small audience, we did get to do a Christmas Carol. 
This which year. We, yeah, this year, which we did as a radio play. And mm-hmm. that was in the end of 2020. But literally, it was like, we can have 25 people in the building. So it was, you know, yeah. that was crazy. But the last thing we had that was open to the public was WWE Hall of Famer Mick Foley yeah. came in and did his one-man show. Well, wow. also, we did do Charlotte's Web. But, but like, that was not in the building. That's true. That's true. Yeah. yeah. It, so, but, but it's great, though, that it's finally starting to gain that traction again. Mm-hmm. And, I mean, you're kicking off 2021 with such a cool exhibit. And also the uh, Native Reflections exhibit that we were talking about. People have until February 14th to check yes. that out. That right? Yes, that is correct. And we're going to also try and do a, um, a virtual walkthrough that we're going to now post on our page as well. Yeah. Ah, so okay. Warriors of Anakatua. Anagatawa. Nope. Anagatawa. 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 That, it, it sounds more Japanese than you know? Native American. And, and here's the funny thing. We're, all of us in this room right now are basing that as the correct pronunciation on somebody else who pronounced it on YouTube. <laughs> and he was like. <laughs> <laughs> he was holding a piece of paper and was like, yeah, yeah like, uh, I don't so, know. <laughs> but if you, if, you know, if you look them up, you'll be able to, you know, we can even spell it. Yeah, well, but <laughs> everybody has different pronunciations of course, everywhere, you know. Please. Yeah, whenever I lived in the city and I uh, started living here, I learned a lot of new pronunciations. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Who lie? Where I said, what is that? <laughs> E-Reich. And they say that. I was like, that's, okay, that's that's not how I would say that. That's fine. Well, um, one, one cool thing, though, about the uh, Native Reflections, going back to it, is some of the art that you were talking about is actually purchasable. Oh, yes, right. it is. Yes. All the, all the art in the exhibit. Is for sale. Um, not the artifacts from the Big Sandy yes, no, Heritage Museum. Those. <laughs> those are uh, on Part of loan a collection. Yeah. Uh, f- uh, from the people who owned them. Um, <laughs> they're on loan from people who don't own them. I don't own them. I, they're on loan. In fact, your from... car, Eli, is now on loan from me. Anybody who'd like it, call me. <laughs> but I, I really, though, I, I'm kind of jealous about these people that uh, yeah. uh, own this stuff. I, in people, fact, can, people can go there and see, some and see of them the names sold. on them. Some of them arrived to us and they'd already been sold. Yeah. Oh, wow. Yeah. yeah. So it'll say, you know, it, it would You never say see it. anything like this on Pat County Trade and Sale on you Facebook. Know, it really I know. Takes me Darn off. it. You know, people are like, oh, I got this Botticelli. It was in the back. <laughs> <laughs> do, do they know uh, how they date this stuff and how they can tell what's what? It has to do with the, the way that it was, uh, the way that the, like when it comes to the arrowheads, it was what material were yep. they using at the time? How was it flaked off? Yep. Um, mm-hmm. And what what you know you can tell by the number of notches, notches how they were putting it together yeah as well as some of them are st- were still had fragments of the the cord that was attaching it to the to the top of the arrowhead were originally part of it and so they would date those oh okay that makes yeah. sense now the smart that, people out there which is also uh, strangely people. not exactly accurate it may be considerably older than that because they would snap the arrowhead off and reuse them even oh. you know yeah. if, the, if the arrow you know if you if shot it, something it shot and didn't Land on its target, or and the arrow itself broke. They yeah. would just untie it, retie it to another thing. Yeah. Huh. So they would, you know, because those were valuable. Those those were incredibly valuable because it just took time and skill to get them. Pr- to, to, to yeah, yeah. When, whenever I was lo- I was looking at this uh, the Kelt mm-hmm. tool, and again we'll put mm-hmm. this picture up for everybody. I couldn't imagine how much time it took to. I know. S- I, I guess they just like rock to rock. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. I guess is what they. Yeah. yeah. And then the funny thing is that they there are only they would have find specific kinds of rocks that like this is going to be a good one that I could use to chip away this fl- the flakes and mm-hmm. so that rock the tool that was used to make those <laughs> cool. was really valuable you yeah. know because they were like well I this rock is going to this is going to be the rock that I use for the rest of my life cuz it's perfect yeah. and if that rock if you and drop it, it and t- crack it it would be yeah. tied to their waist yeah it was a big that was or a big in deal. their in their Satchel. Pack. To me, the Native Americans had it right as as to what we were supposed to do as a human species, almost. I mean, like how you were talking earlier about how they had a trade center, everybody traded. Yeah. Mm-hmm. They had an equal agreement on this land, on when they could hunt, who was hunting, mm-hmm. yada, now, yada, yada, yada. Don't, don't get us wrong. We've also learned that oh, there was war. There of was giant wars between yeah. them. wars between tribes. <laughs> but, but but also just the fact like how they knew to live off the yes. land, and I mean that. See, when, whenever all the COVID hit last year, I it, it was kind of one of those oh crap moments for me because I was thinking, you know, <laughs> if, if these stores do shut down, you it, don't it, know how to make anything. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah, right. yeah, I have no idea. I don't know how to grow whatever. Yeah. I don't know where to hunt whatever i had no if i had to live off the land if a lot of people oh had to gosh, live off the land nowadays me? they would be screwed Please, I, you yes. know what I, all i have to say is this you tell me which part of wheat 
turns into flour. Go ahead. <laughs> exactly. No idea. <laughs> well, you know, when the downturn happened in uh, 2008, 2008? Sure. Is that what it was? Um, there was a whole big movement, uh, even up in New York and New Jersey, uh, about like being going back to the land. And uh-huh. at, there were classes. Uh, <laughs> no, at, we could stay at home. We didn't have to stay at home, but yeah. there, were, there were classes about, you know, um, uh, planting food and, and urban gardens uh-huh. and how everyone yeah. would fend for themselves. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, they were so smart whenever it comes to all that. We like to think of people like that as tribes, tribal animal people, you know, that yeah. don't know. But, no, these were, you know, again, it's and it goes back to what we were talking about earlier, just history in general. All of these culture, societies and cultures were just that. They were full-fledged civilizations that figured out how to live where they, where they were. Mm-hmm. And without Netflix. Yeah, and exactly. without Netflix, how did they do it? <laughs> I'd say it was so peaceful, though. <laughs> so peaceful. And, and like I said, and that, that's why I think it's such a fascinating culture. And uh, for people out there that's like interested in stuff like this, like I am, to have the opportunity to see something like this, like a 10,000-year-old axe head yeah. right in the middle of downtown Pikeville, Kentucky, when else are you going to get that other yeah. opportunity? Now? Yeah, it, it's really cool. Yeah, I mean, every, every couple of days I just go up and I'm like, that's really cool. These are really cool. Yeah. And that's, you know, that's the extent of our archaeolog- archaeological knowledge. Yeah. Is, so that's cool. Well, <laughs> what's going to happen to this uh, whenever it leaves? What, what happens to all the exhibits? Do they just go They somewhere? move on they to another community. Yeah. And they get, uh, this gets, uh, we pack it up, and they come down from Frankfurt, uh, Mark Brown from the Kentucky Arts Council. Load it all up. Loads it up and takes Brings it, it to the next, to the next, next destination. Wow. Yeah. yeah. And we were just, you know, again, we I will say we were incredibly grateful that the Kentucky Arts Council reached out to us. And uh, they were like, we have this available. You have a space, right? We're like, yes, we do. Yes, we do. Absolutely. I was like. And yes. it's, you know, look, and, I, and this is not me tooting Robin's horn here, which I would never do in a family show, um, is that. Um, is, is that, that was a good one. That was a good one. <laughs> Thank you. I'll be, I'll, I'll be here for another few minutes. No, um, <laughs> it's basically. Improv comedy Wednesdays at 7. Exactly. Uh, which is basically the fact that. Because of the hard work that Robin's done since she got down here, I'll say I've done some hard work too. But since the hard work Robin's done since she's come down here, uh, we've been getting a lot more, a lot of recognition from the powers that be in not just the arts community, but in the uh, the part of the government that helps with the arts in Kentucky. And mm-hmm. they've been like, we know, we know you, we trust you, we've seen the quality of the work that you guys do. So we'd love to, you know, not only help you by giving this to you, we feel comfortable entrusting this to you and that you'll make sure that it gets seen. Well, and we have, yeah. you know, the backing of uh, the city and the the arena, you know. And the community. Uh, dare I say, everyone is working together to make <laughs> beautiful things happen. You know what I mean? It, yeah, it's I know really, what you mean. It's really true. It's cool. Yeah, see, it's it's a really, really neat exhibit. And the fact that it's free, it's right there in downtown Pikeville. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I mean, you have an elevator, stairs, whatever anybody yeah. wants to use. And also just the, the interesting facts that you, they can read off of it as well, like the uh, the bone all that was used for uh, piercing clothing mm-hmm. and making clothing and stuff like that. Because you, you, well, it's one of those things that you don't think about. You knew that they had clothing. You knew that they done all these things. But you think... They didn't have an Ace Hardware. Right, they they exactly. didn't have no Lowe's right. to pick. What did they do? They made. I, they had to use everything. Yeah. Yeah. There was no exclusion. And it, and it goes towards what you were saying is that, you know, but they were, but also that was also someone's, it sounds funny to say someone's job, but that was someone's job was they yeah. said, I'm the person, you know, I, I can make my, and but everybody knew like those, you know, those people who were the hunters who went out and hunting and said, okay, we'll be back in six weeks. Well, you know, if a guy ripped his pants. You didn't just walk around with ripped pants. They're like, okay, I have, I brought with me a bone needle and I have a little bit of, you know, cord to fix things should it happen. They came prepared and they all knew how to do those things. If my pants rip and I'm not near a store, people are just going to get a show. That's yeah. all. Yeah, I, I, I need a stapler or something. That's not the only way I'm going to fix duct it. Duct tape. I was going to say, if you have black pants, that's a trick. If you have black pants... And you have black duct tape, I, you I, can fix them. Yeah, <laughs> I bet you have learned all types of tricks like that working in oh theater. Oh, my gosh. Oh, yes, absolutely. Oh, yeah, absolutely. Oh, That's, oh, yes. That happened, at, I can't remember what show it was. I, I was doing someone's pants, like, blew out, just gone. That was it, just a mile-wide rip. And the costume person went, okay, great, and we black pants. And had and black, turned them inside t- out. Turned them inside out, had black um, duct, duct tape, tape, and t- taped it up. And you could not tell that those pants were ripped. It was crazy. 
Wow, that's a, a little bit of redneck and ingenuity, you know. There we go. <laughs> tinkering, tinkering, yeah, absolutely. Tinkering. Appalachian yes. tinkering. Well, and you know, I I think um, there's there's probably every family probably has incredible stories about their mama or papa or great grandma blowing out their pants. <laughs> when he, no, <laughs> I've got no, a few of those. I I, I, I'm sorry. I, I know. Please, Eric is very offensive. I was wondering where you were I'm going sorry. with this. That's all. All of the grandmas like, and grandpas. And Mama pulled out. He didn't the, mean that. Mama pulled out the duct tape and what? <laughs> no, I'm just saying that there's all kinds of Appalachian ingenuity. Yes. Um, and people have stories. Uh, yeah. that they're keeping close to their heart. And, and, and they're beautiful stories, too, of a, a forgotten time. Because nowadays, it's, it's, it's almost too easy. It's a disposable community. Yeah. That's a great way to summarize yeah. it. It's the yeah. instant gratification yep. uh, generate. I mean, we, we really, Gen X, you know, that forgotten generation. <laughs> that does, no one really cares about Gen X. Um, but uh, we were that first... Instant gratification generation, you know, Lipton yeah. soup, pour it in, it oh. was ready in a minute. And we were also, the, you know, we were, this This is, you know, going a far afield here, but we were the generation that got the first introduction of at-home video game systems. Mm. Oh, yeah, like when I was four, Beep. when I was four, my uncle brought home a Pong system. Beep. I was going to ask And was I was Pong. like, this is, the mo- this is the most incredible thing. First of all, when you see Pong now, you it is more exciting but to watch paint dry. imagine, <laughs> like, when, when we saw it, it was just oh, like... Oh my God! You're like this is incredible, and the thing that made me laugh on was Christmas one of the ga- one of the games you could play. This is not a joke. It was still pong. Was high lie, and all that meant was you could push a button when the ball when the little pong ball hit your pa- the paddle, uh-huh. and it would stick to the paddle for a second, and then you would move the paddle and go whing and let go of the button, and the ball would go flying. And when, off. when and that we was were, high lie. When we were working in Florida, I the um, oh. I saw that sign for high lie. I was like, oh my gosh. Yes. We have to. Oh my gosh, we have and, to go but, to that game. And it's crazy, like how fast technolo- technology is advancing nowadays. It's almost oh like gosh. too fast. Well, it's you know, it's funny is that there actually there's a thing called um, Moore's law, which has to do with the the the. I don't know why I know this. Uh, which has to do with the rate of Cliff um, Clavin. <laughs> thank you. Which has to do with the rate of how quickly processors get faster and how my, how um, the rate at which. Um, memory doubles and such. Oh. And for a while, their Moore's law was like insanely high, and now it's actually getting lower again. The next thing that they're going to come, that the next thing that will actually break Moore's law and make the cycle start happening is going to be quantum computing, which I only know those two words. I have no idea what they mean, just quantum computing. Yeah, I've heard of quantum <laughs> mechanics and yes. stuff like that. I'm, I'm way too dumb yeah. nope. to understand that. I can't, I, can't, I can't even, I don't even understand what's going on on Wall Street. Yeah, right I, I, now. I, I, oh, exactly. yeah. oh my I was, gosh. I'm it, good. It, well, it is great. It's quite a story. What well, is this? For, what's going on in Wall Street? The GameStop. Oh my gosh! Oh, yeah. I, okay. I literally I read a thing where I I finally okay I understand. I, now I understand what a short means. I understand what they like they, that they were trying to short the stock, which literally meant, uh, you know what? It's too too long. It's too long. It's li- <laughs> okay. It was literally like. Uh, this person owns a hundred. I'm going to use much smaller numbers. This person owns a hundred shares of something, uh-huh. and each one of those shares is worth a hundred dollars. This person, who could afford to buy those shares if he wanted to, instead says, "I have enough money to pay for those. Do you mind if I borrow those stocks from you for a week?" And the person goes, "Yeah, sure. You're, you're good. You're good, for, you're good for it." That person takes the stock and sells them. So he takes stock, a hundred shares, a hundred shares mm-hmm. that are worth a hundred dollars. And he sells them. So he now has $100 in his hand. Okay. He's betting that that stock price is going to go down. So let's say instead that 100 shares, instead of being $100 now, at the end of the week is worth $70. He buys back 100 shares that are now worth $70 and says, here's your 100 shares. Thank you. And he pockets the difference, the 30 bucks. So he doesn't actually do anything. He literally just says, I'm betting that stock is going to go down and I will get to keep the difference in price. And what ended up happening was this this um, Reddit user and a whole bunch of people who follows. He has a hundred thousand followers or something crazy like that. And he said, "I've been watching this hedge fund. They have a short on GameStop um, stock. They're doing this for over a year. They're betting that this pr- price is going to come down, and the short is going to come due. Meaning he has to give those stocks back, those that number, same number of stocks right. back at a certain time." He mm-hmm. said, "We should all buy, buy those stocks stock. and Ooh. drive the price up." Right. Because that person who is shorting the stock has to ultimately buy the same number of stocks back to give it back. 
So he's forced, no matter what the price is, to buy it back, to give it back. So they drove the price crazy high. It went from, at one point, it was $4 when the short started. Mm -hmm. Uh And then they noticed that it was creeping up like to $8 because people started buying the stock. So the stock started going up. Then they kept buying it and kept buying it. So the stock went from like $4 to $100. Oh my God. And that person, that hedge fund, had to buy back the same same number of stocks. Not price, how, the same number of shares. How much so he money had is billions. that? He had to spend, he lost billions of dollars. That hedge fund lost a bill, billions of dollars, had to buy back all of the same sh- number so of shares. So he had to, bu- the, you know, to we're give them back. saying he, so, but had to borrow yeah, from other hedge fund buddies. To pay for it. So all wow. the people who bought that stock at $12, and because he had to buy it back, it went back up, it went up even further. I'm okay with this. Yeah, it was, you I'm know, okay it was one that. of those things. Yep. And it was so funny. People were like, Wall Street is complaining that someone's gaming the system. I was like going, yeah, but I you're gaming the do. system. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Every day. So you're, I was going to say, and if you think about it, 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 quite frankly, a shorting a stock literally does nothing. It is, there's nothing is made, nothing is created, no services no are given. Investiture it's, yeah. it's, in, there's no, no investment in the business itself. It's just somebody going, I want to take some money. I, I'm, I'm not even paying for anything. I'm borrowing something from you, selling it for a, for a, for a higher price than what I'm going to buy it back for. I get to keep some of the money and give it back to you. Nothing happens. Wow. Good for them. Yeah. I've seen some, uh, mm-hmm. uh, of course, I've been seeing all the memes on yeah, Facebook yeah. just like everybody else, but I've seen one on there. I think it was uh, back in 2008, 2009, whenever the stock market mm-hmm. crash oh, yeah. happened or yep. whatever mm-hmm. it was. Mm-hmm. And uh, it showed pictures of the uh, stock market people kind of looking down on Occupy Wall Street with glasses of champagne oh, yes. oh, in their yeah. best suits, just waving at oh, everybody. Yeah. Yeah. And the fact that them people right now are like, uh, they're yep. getting what they deserve yeah. to me. Well, and here's the thing it, it, that, that system, I'll be, be 100% percent honest i don't know how it works i don't understand how it works anymore it you we in fact we're having this discussion it used to be i would invest in a company and hope that the company gets more successful makes more widgets has to buy a new factory to make more widgets uh it gets a big order a giant order from a giant company for more widgets that makes the company more profitable and mm-hmm. i get some money back from it that's, that's great. That's an old model. That's not yeah. how it happens anymore. Now it's literally money moves yeah. back and forth. That does nothing is never fully well, invested in the business. Money. Yeah, you buy and sell money. Yeah, see, see, I'm like Steve Carell there on The Office when he says, explain this to me like I'm five. Oh, absolutely. That, that's, how, that's how I felt at the beginning that, that's of all how this. I, that's how I live my life. People, <laughs> see, people, people say this and I go, I, I feel, I literally Stop. feel like the, the dog and the RCA Victor cover. I'm like, <laughs> and then they say, I'm going to use smaller words, Eric. And I'm like, fantastic. <laughs> it, it, it's, a fascinate, it's fascinating how the world is changing Oof. so much and uh, just and trying to keep up with the times. Exponential speed, you mm. know. Mm-mm-mm. Hence, again, now I'm, as fast as it is here, imagine how crazy it is living in New York. Yeah, I, which is I, I again and that's how, why, we came back how we came back here. <laughs> and to, how to wrap it up, it's like <laughs> that's how. That's why one of the reasons why we said I don't want to talk to people that about <laughs> yeah, speed I don't <laughs> with with that um, fervor of of life, with that intensity of life. Uh, there's a lot that goes with that, and that's why I was like, well, I, I, there's a lot of huh. depersonalization. Yeah, and I will say that you know, if if nothing else, life in uh, this part of the country is very personal, yeah, and yeah. it's much more personal, which is great. And then someone who can come by, or for I was going to say, and then other people yeah. come it's by like, and go, it's a little too it's personal, personal sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, well like, whenever I visited personal. New York, like it, it just. <sighs> See, around here, you get that Southern hospitality. Yeah. If somebody opens the door for you, you say thank you. Then you open up the door for somebody else and yada, yada, yada. It's just, uh, it, it's almost like the niceness is contagious. And yeah. wants, you want to spread it around. Mm-hmm. In New York, people just look down. They walk right by you. Well, I went with $150. I was like 15, 16 years old. I thought I was rich. <laughs> I'm like, man, I'm going to go to New York and I'm going to ball out. I'm going to buy <laughs> everything. I was able to but afford a t-shirt. A, a t-shirt, <laughs> a piece of pizza, a can of Coke, and, uh, I, I for, and you I for, had to come home. Exactly. Yeah, that, that was basically. Yeah. No, I, I bought a. Uh, I went to Olive Garden. Okay. And, and I and I is the oh, no. uh, the lasagna was like seventeen dollars. Yes. And I was like, oh. man, for seventeen dollars, I'm gonna get a lot of lasagna. That's no. cool. It was the smallest square. Oh, yes, that I've ever seen in my entire. Oh, yeah. It was but like it, three. And bites. yet, the funny thing is that we was ta- we were talking about this the other day. Is there were sh- there are were still are, but there were places in New York that y- if you were a New Yorker, if you lived in New York. 
You knew where to go. Yeah. There was a place, and they, they, <laughs> there was a place. If you've ever seen the movie or the musical Rent, they talk about yeah. the. Uh, it was a cafe AB dojo. No, it was called Cafe ABC or something in the play. But it's, and it's Dojo. And it was a, yeah, it was a, 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 real it was a restaurant yes, called it was. Dojo. It, they've huh. all since closed. Yes. But Dojo was a place. It was a big old restaurant. And it was mostly a place where college. There was one on St. Mark's Place. And, and 14th. Uh-huh. Uh, and it was mostly. Uh, hmm. No, not more 14th. Um, it was by NYU. Yeah, NYU, yeah. Um, and it was mostly artists would go there. Students would go there. Because it was absolutely dirt cheap, and there yeah. was the, what you would the, everybody would buy the same thing when you went in. You would go out and say, I'm, "I would like the soy burger. I would like the soy burger dinner deluxe," and you would get a big old soy burger patty that was deep fried, so it was actually kind of tasty. It was good, and then it had a, it had cheese and a sauce on it. It and came a, with a big a pile salad. of brown rice uh-huh. and then a salad, and that thing, that whole giant plate of food, was four ninety five. Whoa. And it didn't change for years. Years. For years. And even huh. when it did go up, like, I don't know. You know, like five, or, yeah, about went, 12 years ago. Yeah, it went up to like, like six, six, six ninety five. We were like. I was like, still cheap. <laughs> um, Yeah. Uh, yeah, well, whenever I bought the little piece of pizza and the can of pop I was telling you about, I'm pretty sure that was like $8 uh, or something oh yeah, like that. And it wasn't even that big of a pizza piece. Like, I was thinking, like, oh, I'm going to get like the New York slice that everybody talks about. One, it's like they got a little Caesar's pizza. Yeah, exactly. It's, 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 it's unfortunate. You got to know where to go. Yeah, yeah, but even that old New York, like, we've been gone. We've been gone for two, two, we, two years since we moved from sub, the suburbs around New York, mm-hmm. and it's been uh, 10 years since we lived in New in York. In the city. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we worked in the city, but, yeah. you know, um, well, I worked out in really? the university. But, um, <laughs> uh, well, I see, I've seen apartments that people would talk oh about there Lord. in New York City that they wanted $10,000 for, like, like a I forget if it was a year or a month. I don't know how much rent is up there, but the apartments that these people would be living in and paying these ungodly amounts of money like would be half room, the size of this yeah, yeah. room. We used this to, room would go for depending on where it was. Yeah, four thousand. That's a, no, a month. No, on, yes. It, honestly, we used to play a game. Uh, I toured the country with shows and you know with musicals going around the country, and we used to play a game where whenever we went into a, a new area, we'd say, "What could I afford?" And it would be okay for what my apartment is, in and like I we I'll never forget was we were in, uh, Green Greenville North Carolina, and North Carolina or South Carolina? Greenville South Carolina Greenville South Carolina and you grab the local real estate play board and like it was the second day you were in town say all right let's play it and yeah you know, all right Eric how much is your rent fourteen hundred dollars a month okay fourteen hundred dollars a month let me open up. Okay, for fourteen hundred dollars a month, you could afford a four bedroom, three and a half bath <laughs> house with a with two and a half acres of land. <laughs> wow! And we would laugh and laugh and laugh. Yeah. So, it, how do people afford these places? Like, is the is the the uh, pay better yes. at places? I was going to yes. say they, it's, they, it's, it's not quite on scale. Uh huh. You know, and they, there's actually a, a very funny. Um, uh, an author named Fran Lebowitz, and she actually has a show now called Pretend It's a City. <laughs> and it's an interview that she does with Martin Scorsese. Right. And she she's, talks about I the mean, fact she's that, 70. Oh, yeah. So she remembers old New York. Yeah. She yeah. remembers Yeah, but she, she basically talks about the fact that nobody can afford to live in New York. So you can't afford to live in New York, but you figure out how to afford to live in New York. Yeah. That's it. There's no there's no rhyme or reason unless you happen to be, as we were talking about, one of those people on Wall Street where you're, you know, where you're, Seriously, your bonus is $10 million this year. Then yeah. you can afford to live in New yeah. York. I had a friend who uh, used to be a word processor uh, doing, da- for, doing for data a for firm. a Wall Street firm. And he was typing up the checks. Mm-hmm. Uh, and some of these for the yearly investment bonus, yeah. bankers were, you know, $25 million, $30 million, were their yeah. bonuses. God. So it's, you know. So they're there, and that's commensurate. But that, even that being said, like show business and the pay skills, they were crazy. It used to be that if you lived, if you worked on Broadway, you could live an almost middle class life in New York, which still means living in an apartment, usually a smaller apartment, just because apartments in New York, as they get larger, become exponentially more expensive. Mm-hmm. Um, but if you worked off Broadway, off Broadway used, I have friends of mine who worked in the fan, worked on a show called The Fantastics, which was the longest running show off Broadway history. It was like had been around for sixty years, and they all had to have day jobs while they were working their night job. Yeah. Wow, <laughs> and but but if I mean if you're wanting that type of lifestyle, yeah. I guess it's, it's what a you lifestyle. Have to do. And, yes, and also especially yeah. now, oh, it yeah. became 
it's be it's become a lifestyle. Yeah, it, it's uh, become it's become prohibitively expensive to live in New York. Yeah. So what does happen is there there's a lot of people who are to the manor board. Like, oh yeah. I mean, I had a number of friends who just mommy and daddy they were bought heirs. their apartment. Yeah. yeah. And you know what? God bless them. That's great. You know, if my if my kid was, his own. Yeah, I said if my kid does it, and you know, she's like, "This is what we want to do." We were like, "Please don't do that." And she said, "Yes, we want to do this." Like, okay, great. We would do. You know, we would figure out how to do that and help her. Mm-hmm. You know, that was just not for either of us. That was not our. You know, our manners were not so much. You know, manners as they were. That's the house down the street. So my folks yeah. were like, you know. Good luck. <laughs> yeah, I've uh, I, I had some uh, step family that came from the New York area. I don't even know exactly where they lived, but uh, whenever they came here to visit, they had never seen the stars really before, oh, like oh, like, yeah. like how it is out yeah. here. Nope. They have never seen mountains. Some of them oh. didn't even know really almost hardly what grass looked like. It seemed like, well, and uh, yeah, just how different of an atmosphere oh, and an area that it is well, up there. It's night and day compared to a place it, like here, this. Here's a perfect example. We had a friend, dear friend of ours. Uh, I was doing a show with her in Florida. We were going to be there for, you know, we knew we were going to be there for three and a half months. She looks at me. She goes, I think I'm going to get my license. And I said, your license to do what? And she said, and my driver's license. I said, what? She oh, said, I yeah. need to get my okay. driver's license. Yeah. I said, you don't have a driver's license? She was 36. Whoa. I said, you don't have a driver's license? She goes, I grew up in New York, City, New York City. I was born and raised in New York City. Why would I have a car? And I stopped and said, you're 100% right. Yeah. You would never own a car. You would never drive a car. So I taught her how to drive, and she took her driver's license in Florida. She wow. got, her, got her license in Florida. Well, that was another thing that uh, my, my family was talking about, how the, the parking situation. Yeah, a lot of times you wouldn't buy a car. And, and, and if you did have a car, you had to pay some place to park, and that was just as outrageous as the rent. So that's why yeah. people just walk well, and, everywhere. I mean, and you could always see people who like uh, don't have the... Seven hundred dollars a month to uh, that's pay for, for parking. That's for a parking spot. Yeah, for just exactly. for a parking spot. Um, they they're out in their car, alternate yeah. side street parking, reading the paper. Yeah, that's- it's part of your day. Is you just go, okay, great. I'm going to have to wake up and move the car from the spot and sit there for for the two and a half hours that they're cleaning the car, that they do the street cleaning and then move the car back in. And so you just see literally. Parking almost in the middle of the street, and it's just they understand that the, the city goes, yeah, that's what's going to happen to happen. Waiting for the street cleaner to go by, then they can pull like back. Like our that friend was crazy. like, I have to have my mobile hotspot because I, I, I work, work in the car. I work in the car, yeah. and then I move it. Oh yeah, wow, it, 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 it is. <laughs> that's ab- mind blowing. It, uh, there's much. Uh, uh, there's a lot of labor that goes mm-hmm. involved. But that being that said, that being said, some of the best museums on earth. Some of the best restaurants on earth, mm-hmm. some of the best arts and culture on earth, and it's it is again it's on a, earth. Yeah, but it's yeah. A, it's the give and take. Yeah, exactly. And, and also, it supports every reality. Mm-hmm. Um, that you can see uh, someone who's getting in their limo, who's just closed a billion dollar deal, and right next to them mm-hmm. is a homeless person. It, it's yeah. it, and it, that it's side by side. is. Um, Extraordinary to witness. Yeah. Well, and when it comes to people like us that are in the entertainment industry, you know, New York is our East Coast mm-hmm. mecca. Yep. You have mm-hmm. Madison Square Garden, you have Broadway, you mm-hmm. have the Comedy Cellar, you have well, no matter what type of uh, art form that you're in, there's all these just legendary places. Absolutely. And I, but I, I not right it. now. Yeah, right now. I mean, like, we, well, we talk to our friends all the time and, and they're like, yeah, there's this, nothing. I mean, there's it's, nothing yeah, Broadway's, going on. Broadway has been closed for a year now. Almost a year. Almost a year. And it will be closed for over a year because they've already said we're not reopening. And the earliest we'll reopen is September. So all of these people who their livelihood, people, friends of ours who have been in eight, nine, ten, in some cases, 20 Broadway shows. Mm-hmm. Dancers. They've been unemployed for a wow. year. That's it. They're like, nope, there's nothing. And you and, and you there's can't not go anywhere. There's not temp work and uh, like no, even like, their side hustles. Like it's just like big, so yeah. entire apartments are left. Uh, people have, are, are have At, left that was, the city. Well, during the worst of the during the worst of COVID in New York, people really were starting to sort of flee a little bit, and they would just go, "Great, I'm leaving all my stuff on the sidewalk. Wow. See ya." That's it, it's, it's mind blowing. And you know what else could they have done? Nothing. That's, that's what it. they had to do. Yeah. I, I'd say that you. We're looking at that though, thinking, yeah, we made oh, the yes, right we choice. Were. Oh yeah, we. So many of our friends, because we, we always joke. So many of our friends are like, "You're moving where? Why? Why are you going to like, Kentucky?" And uh, then they call us up, like, "Boy, did you get out on a right <laughs> moment? Do you have anything?" Yeah. I'm like, 
But uh, but again, uh, we're and that all being said, it goes towards what you were saying even earlier, talking about the community of artists down here. There's a community of artists in New York City, and mm-hmm. they, as much as yes, there is a bit of a certain element of being cutthroat. It is. I've never so seen. It, supportive. I've never seen a community pull together tighter for each other. Well, artists in general. Yeah. You know, yeah. They, art is collaborative. Art, you know, artists have to uh, reach out to other artists to make ends meet. And, and also to, because those are the only people that understand, create. they understand the insanity yeah, of the how, life you've chosen. Yeah. <laughs> it, it, it's, you know, it's, it's not for everybody. That's no. what I tell Absolutely. all of my friends. No. And they don't realize that it's a job just like anything else, oh, yeah. especially if you oh. take it serious. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Uh, and, and it's so cool, though, that you've made almost a... Uh, it's like a melting pot, the Appalachian Center for the Arts, because you have music, you have theater, you have comedy. Anybody, whatever they want to do, can be done down there at the app. And if they even want to learn. Yeah. See, a, oh, lot yeah. Of, a lot of times, like even whenever I started doing a stand-up comedy, I had nowhere to go and learn. I didn't yeah, have right. anybody that I could rely on to maybe show me the do's and don'ts. Mm-hmm. And here, right in Pikeville, Kentucky, you've got people with as much knowledge and experience of the industry as y'all have. It's a very special thing. Well, and one of the things I will say, it was when Robin, when Robin was, when they were debating renaming the building, Robin was like, they could like, what about this theater? And what about this theater? And Robin said, no, it has to be about the arts yeah. and the arts plural. And one of the things I will say that comes along with the, you know, and this is more just stuff, as we always say, this is a function of just being as old as we are, um, oh. is the, um, the experience <laughs> oh. that we've had is that we also have a lot of friends who, because of the nature of being artists who want to help and help and nurture things like that. We reach out to like we had we had a couple of the guys from the national tour of Hamilton came in and did a master class a couple of years ago. We had a friend of ours who came in from Lion King. We've talked to specifically like you were just saying we have a friend of ours. God, Brian's been a stand up comedian for 40 years. Yeah. And we were talking about him coming in and doing us doing a like a uh, stand up, a stand up oh, workshop, cool. workshop, you know, so it's like here. This is this is my experience. And yeah, yeah. well, this area around here, I, I've talked with so many and R- use on wicked. Yes. That's all <laughs> yes, there's that that's going to be one of the next things. Oh, yeah. uh, that's oh that's pretty exciting yeah. right there. That's yeah. I haven't got a chance to uh, watch that play myself, but I've I got friends that are into it and I've heard nothing but good things. Mm. But but also just the uh, like you were saying earlier, I think we we know that music is a big thing mm. around here, but mm. I do think that there's other people that are wanting to try out stuff like yep. improv comedy or stand up yep. comedy or mm-hmm. theater or even if it's just behind the scenes, yeah. Oh, yeah. costume oh. design yeah. and, uh, and yada, we, yada yada yada. And the door is always open for that. And we you know we have people who are you know <clears throat> are artists who are looking to work backstage. We've got great opportunities. Well, and people have such incredible innate. Um, learned skills and like seamstresses and and people who sew. I mean, we I needed something uh, um, uh, altered, uh, taken in uh, for the Christmas show, and she was like, "Okay, yeah, I'll do it." And it was back the next day. I was yeah. like, huh. "And and then that person, and again, that's the kind of person who says, oh, just let me know what you need.'" Yeah. You know, and we're like, well, we'll we will if you if you tell us, let you know what you need. We're you're, gonna tell you what we you're need. Opening the <laughs> watch, door. Watch, watch what you say. We will take you up on it. <laughs> yeah, I've lived uh, many places all around the United States, and for some reason, in Eastern Kentucky, is that the the artistic ability that people have. I've never seen anywhere else. Whenever it comes to the songwriting, whenever it comes uh, unbelievable. to unbelievable, it, it, it's amazing. Well, and, I think it. Com- I mean, it, it it comes from the the earth. It comes yeah. from. Well, I, From within, I, it's just it's I, deep one, and it's real. One, one theory that I have is maybe the hard times that people had to go through around here. Because I, I do believe that whenever you're facing hard times, Absolutely. that beautiful art comes out of mm-hmm. it. And Absolutely. Maybe. I don't know. But it's just I've never seen another place on earth like Eastern Kentucky whenever it comes to the amount of talent yeah. yes, in this yes. area. Well, and I also think that it's a, it's a function of the what makes the area so beautiful geographically is its isolation. So therefore, that also goes into the goes into the art and artisan crafts. Is that you don't always you can't always go somewhere and say, well, I want to see a beautiful piece of art. Let me go suchware and buy it. You go, well, we're going to have to make it. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So, so that's why I'm thankful that y'all have decided to move here two years ago and all the wonderful things that you've done since well, then. Y'all have been a blessing to now, this community. We, we are really you. Have. incredibly it, grateful we, to be we're here. We're blessed to be here. The, we're the, students of wherever yeah, we are. We're, we, you know, the, the only way that you, you learn to be 
a person is by learning how other people live. Yeah. That's it. But again, thank you all for everything that you've done. You've uh, given me opportunities, which I'm very thankful for, and all the opportunities that you've uh, gave to people to come out and be entertained, whether it's from a show or from an art exhibit. You're uh, really creating memories in people's lives. And, thank you. Uh, That's Thank you. That's the nicest compliment. Yeah, it, it's, it's really a beautiful thing that y'all are doing and continuing to do. And anything that y'all ever need from me, I will be here to help with that. But just again, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And for anybody that wants to check out all the cool stuff that the Appalachian Center for the Arts has to offer and maybe even be a part of uh, some of the programs that you have Absolutely. available, how do they do that? Uh, you go to our website, which is www.theapparts.org, which is T-H-E-A-P-P. A-R-T-S dot org. And you can also find us on Facebook at at the app arts. And also on Instagram. And on Instagram and Twitter also at at the app arts. Listen, there's so many. It's yes. (laughs) (laughs) I could make up a name. Also on Breeze, which is at and people go, where's Breeze? (laughs) And I encourage everybody to check out the uh, Native Reflections exhibit, which is going to be going on until February 14th, Valentine's Day. Indeed. Nice, nice. Yeah. Again, Thank y'all, and I'm looking forward to uh, next time. Well, thank you so much. Look, thank can't you. wait. See you next week, folks. Boom. And there we go. Excellent.